I'm Gabe Hamilton, and today our first talk is about smart contracts. Last month, Nessa gave us a great overview of blockchain, Web3, uh, the whole space. And today we're going to kind of dig into this particular area and talk a bunch about smart contracts. So what can we do with a smart contract? Um, you know, it's a, a program, uh, someone writes, someone like you, um, that runs on a blockchain. And we can do some really neat things with these. We can create um, our own uh, market or economy, for instance. Uh, that could be at a small scale, it could be you know, your uh, fantasy football pool with some friends, your own little uh, market there. Um, or it could be uh, much larger. So uh, sharing economy for Wi-Fi, for instance. Um, there's several examples of those. Um, Helium, um, I think uh, CryptFi is another one. So really large scale markets. Uh, we might do some electronic voting, make decisions using a smart contract. Um, so that could be a small scale. We could have a contract that we all vote on what should be the next meetup talk next. Um, but people use this for larger and larger areas of governance, and there are groups experimenting with this for national elections. So it could be that at some point, national elections, you know the result right away because it's on a smart contract, everyone votes, don't have to wait days and days for uh, results to come in. That would be nice. And if I can get the zoom bar out of my way a little bit here. Of course, an annoying spot. Um, so uh, lots of use cases, we'll talk about a bunch, um, but interesting area is, you know, what will you build? Um, and we'll try and get everyone thinking a little bit about use cases for smart contracts, ways you might use them. So this is an exploratory talk. Uh, we'll look at, you know, the good, the bad, interesting um, about smart contracts and uh, try and see a little bit where we want to use them. So uh, some areas we'll discuss, you know, there's a, a lot um, in blockchain. Uh, we're not gonna talk about some of these areas. I'll we'll just kind of call them out. So if you have questions, not part of this talk. <laughs> um, proof of work in Bitcoin, won't really talk about that much. Um, financial speculation, if you're here at this talk to get rich on crypto, not the, the talk for you. Um, you can go work on Wall Street. They'll let you bet on most anything there, build your own derivatives and such. Good for that. Um, there's a lot going on in the crypto space right now in terms of big exchanges failing and things. Uh, that seems to happen in finance all the time. I mean, banks have been around for 400 years or so. Every 10 years, there's some big meltdown in banks. So when will crypto banks stop melting down? Uh, never, I'm sure, always be, be going on. Um, that's just part of how you know banking works a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to try and explain the art market. You know, I don't understand that physically. You know, you, Beautiful piece of art sells for $100. Terrible piece of art sells for $100,000. I can't explain that. So I definitely can't explain how it works digitally either. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the decentralized use cases for smart contracts, blockchain. Uh, some people try and really take that to like, oh, it's going to be this utopia of no censorship. Or maybe that's a dystopia. Uh, we won't get too far into that either. Uh, we'll look at great uses for decentralization, um, but won't really take it to an extreme. So all of those things we're not going to get too much into are kind of in the category of taking something that's already complex in the real world, and making it digital, does not solve the problems, it turns out. Um, you know, it doesn't make it any easier to understand. Uh, you still have to deal with the problems inherent in, in any space, whether you add blockchain or not. But what we are talking about is technology, uh, you know, for building things. We're a meetup group. We talk about technology. We build stuff. So just like we might use S3 for storing files or Twilio for sending SMS, uh, we want to answer, you know, where do smart contracts fit into our systems? We might build some user interfaces in the server, things like that. Where, where do we use a smart contract? What's it good for? So let's define this area a little bit. Uh, first, we've got blockchain. So blockchain, uh, in this case, we mean a consensus algorithm. So several parties, uh, agreeing on the inputs and outputs of some calculation. Uh, an example, you know, uh, is kind of how Bitcoin works. Uh, we might have some really simple inputs and outputs where we have some accounts, you know, say one BAB and two FA. These are hexadecimal accounts here. And they have a number next to them. You know, in Bitcoin, that number is, you know, Bitcoins. If it's Gabe coin, we might call those Gabe coins. Um, and we agree on some really simple calculations. So several different um, computers running an algorithm might agree that, okay, great. You can send from one to another. That means that we subtract 
you know, two from Bab and put it next to Effie. And bang, you've got Bitcoin. That's how Bitcoin works. It's just agreement on some really simple operations. So uh, to get a cryptocurrency on top of a blockchain, we need some economic rules. And uh, those economic rules, uh, generally, you know, they, they might vary from chain to chain, but there's some basic ones. So uh, generally, the, the people who are running the system on their computers, they're going to earn you know, a number in their account. They're going to get some tokens. That number next to their account is going to go up as they um, power the system, as they run it. Um, next rule is that there's some limited number of tokens. They're scarce in some way. There's not an unlimited for everyone. There's, you know, you get some by running the system, so there's there's uh, scarcity there. Um, and generally, in order to have a currency, you need to be able to send it from one place to another. So sending from one to catch another, one of the other basic rules. If you have those things, you've kind of got a cryptocurrency. Pretty pretty straightforward. So um, let's say we're gonna we're gonna build Gabe Coin. We call that number next to the account, Gabe Coin. And I've been running the Gabe Coin uh, protocol on my computer here. Uh, rules of which that every month that I run that, I get one Gabe Coin in my account. Anybody else who runs it also, one one Gabe Coin in their account. And uh, I've been running it for five months, so so I've got five in my account. So why would you care? Why would you want one? Uh, maybe every time someone gives a tech consultant talk, I'm like, here, here's a Gabe Coin. Nifty. Um, and any time someone wants a technology recommendation, Gabe, which database should I use here? Uh, I charge one Gabe Coin for that. So great, we've got a little nice little system. Now maybe uh, Eric doesn't have any Gabe Coin. Uh, you know, I haven't given a talk in a while. So he's like, oh, well, I need this technology recommendation. Um, you know, should I should I use this or this? And uh, I'm like, oh well, don't have any Gabe Coin. Maybe uh, you know, try uh, buying one from Lee. Maybe he'll he'll give you one, and then I'll give you the technology recommendation. He's like, cool, ten bucks. I'll give you this Gabe Coin that I've got. Now we've got an economy. We've established a value for this cryptocurrency. That's pretty much how Bitcoin and, and things like that work. Okay, so that's kind of base things that we have. What we really care about here are smart contracts. So a smart contract is a program that then runs under those economic rules. And we add in a couple uh, rules to make the smart contract work. So uh, rules are that uh, a user who wants to use the smart contract, wants to interact with it, is generally gonna pay a small amount of cryptocurrency. And we call that gas. So you pay for a, a contract to run or a function in a contract to run. Um, so uh, whoever's running the nodes, they charge that gas in order to execute the function. Um, often the function itself, the program might um, charge a little part of that too. So there's incentive for developers as well. So those simple little rules, now we've got a smart contract system. Okay, a um, couple of words that'll come up um, in this, uh, just to cover them, fungible and non-fungible. Um, those mean um, the same, something that's fungible is the same. Um, so like cryptocurrency tokens, one is the same as another one. Um, airline miles are all the same. Uh, you know, it's got 60,000 of them. There, there's no difference between any of them. Uh, coupons, another good case, $5 off coupon, same as another $5 off coupon. Uh, you can think of all these things like casino chips. You know, you create some token or something that's all the same, a lot like a casino chip. Uh, now, something that's different uh, is often called non-fungible. So um, land, you know, one piece of land is not the same as another one. So I'm like, cool, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll trade you the swamp for that, that bridge uh, spot, you know, totally different things. Uh, you know, one condo is not the same as another condo. One in, you know, on uh, Cancun is not gonna be the same as one in Alberta. Uh, account names are another thing, all unique. We create an account um, in, a, in a smart contract, you know, that, that's gonna be different. Um, art registries is where we've seen it come up a lot. So for everyone's sort of NFTs, probably non-fungible tokens, um, people often use that to refer to art that is a um, unique piece of art that's registered on a blockchain. Um, but non-fungible tokens, we have lots of different things. It's just something that's different than, than other things. And of course, uh, some of these things kind of cross over. So if you have a limited edition of some art, you know, there's 300 of them. Well, each of those 300 they can be exchanged, they're kind of the same, but those 300 are not the same as some other ones. So where does that fit? I don't know, in, in between. Um, you know, voting rights might might be the same or they might be different. Um, you know, some currency that has 
uh, some uh, program attached to it, as we'll talk about here in a minute. So maybe currency has a lockup period, not quite the same. My, my currency unlocks next month, your our currency unlocks in two months. Uh, those are slightly different. And, and who knows what interesting things you might invent that kind of fit in between these categories. Okay, so a couple interesting things uh, we can talk about about smart contracts. Uh, distributed computation, programmable money, and fractional ownership. These are all really interesting ways you might use uh, smart contracts. So first, distributed computation. Um, and we'll talk a bit about how smart contracts work in, in this section here. So getting resilient distributed hosting, really handy. So uh, you write a smart contract. You're a uh, you know, developer, you want to write one. And uh, for, let's say, for example, that it's for voting. You want to be able to um, have groups of people vote on things. Maybe it's for voting on the next meetup talk. I'm going to build a little one here. Uh, so you might say the interface for that is these uh, you know, three different functions that can be called. You can create a proposal uh, to be voted on. You can vote on a proposal. And you can read the results. Great. That's you know, most of the system. You want to implement that in some way that you think is going to work. But that would be the, a type of smart contract you could write. So uh, that contract then is going to, uh, uh, when you deploy it to a smart contract platform, is going to run um, much like another cloud function. So just like AWS Lambda or GCP cloud functions, your smart contract is going to run on multiple nodes, and you're going to get all the benefits of, of cloud computing. So um, some of those benefits uh, derive from the underlying blockchain. Uh, and some of those are that uh, these blockchains tend to be open source platforms. Um, everyone's you know, running the same open source code. You can look at it. Um, if, you, you know, if it gets too expensive and you want to run it yourself, you can generally do that. Um, they're uh, transparent by default. Everything's being recorded on the blockchain, everything that happens. So that's really useful for building up trust. People wanting to be able to see, well, what's going on in this exchange? They're like, well, here's, here's exactly what's going on. You can see it in the transaction. And um, blockchains are permanent. They save everything that happens. So also good for building up trust that you can, you know, you can't go back and change history. You can, uh, you know, see everything that's happened. Uh, you might build up trust in, in different ways on a blockchain, but one of the nice advantages is by default is, uh, for interacting with people that you don't know. They have a trustless system. Uh, you know, different nodes can be processing uh, these computations, and the incentives are uh, put together in a way that. Uh, you can, uh, you know, have someone else execute your code and not have to worry about trusting them. That if they're they're trying to um, somehow cheat in some way, that the system is designed to um, try and prevent that. Now, of course, we all know that cybersecurity is a you know endless uh, topic. So uh, being protected against some things doesn't mean you're protected against everything. But um, it's a good place to start. Uh, by default, uh, with these sort of systems, you get distributed transactions, which are hard to build. So that's a nice um, base feature. And uh, we just talked about the cryptocurrency that your smart contract would be built on. So you've got a built in medium of payment for things that you're doing. Also, a really nice property of the system. Uh, so, great, that you kind of get with the blockchain cryptocurrency system. But then uh, with the smart contract platform itself, you know, first you get it's kind of a function as a service. You deploy your function off into the cloud, nodes are going to run it. Um, you get all those nice benefits. So, uh, you know, that's hosted compute, you know, automatic failover, retries, um, that's all really handy. Um, and, uh, you know, a good example of why that's important is uh, I had a friend years ago um, who ran a uh, nice uh, poker game. And he had a, a really great setup um, at a um, hosting provider, had a nice rack uh, full of different servers, the database replicated across the different machines. Um, really good setup, and you know all kinds of failure situations were taken care of. And um, the data center had you know multiple uh, internet connections, backup power, all kinds of things. So really resilient. Except for when a semi came and smashed into that data center and went through the wall and smashed into his rack of computers, knocking out all of the different backups at the same time. So it's really nice to have the properties we have with with cloud computing. I mean, they do it on AWS or GCP or on a smart contract platform where your computation is distributed in different places and safe against semis. 
That applies to your storage as well. It's got some important data, um, you know, the record of votes, for instance, in our voting platform. Uh, it's nice to have those replicated to all the different nodes. Uh, great thing about smart contracts is you can um, charge per transaction. So you can say, great, you're calling this function, we're gonna charge that. Uh, that's really easy to do with a smart contract and you know, can be a little bit harder to do in other cases. Most other um, kinds of software, you, know, you buy like a subscription or maybe you pay some upfront um, because it's hard to do um, charging per function call. Uh, something that we've seen a lot of growth in is uh, using a smart contract as the intermediary. So finance has really taken off as a cryptocurrency use case um, because you don't necessarily need uh, you know, a, a middleman or a, a bunch of middlemen. You can say, okay, the contract is going to be what both sides interact with and it's gonna lock things um, and allow exchanges. Um, so uh, you know, it's got trade-offs, but um, that certainly has reduced the cost of a lot of things. That's why a lot of financial instruments have been built on smart contracts. And then another thing um, that's really easy with smart contracts and hard in other contexts is connecting transactions. So we've seen this with NFT art where you've got some royalties, like great, I sell it to you, you sell it to the next person. Um, and you can build into that smart contract a mechanism so that the you know, original artist gets royalties at each step along the way. Um, and you can connect other transactions like that in a similar manner. Okay, what are some things that are bad about smart contracts? Uh, we're storing data in these things, and it's essentially a slow database. That you know, uh, each of these um, transactions normally takes you know a second, even on a fast blockchain. And I mean, a second's pretty quick for a lot of things. But uh, if you're you know building software systems, and you're normally talking about oh, 10 milliseconds to write to that system, or maybe 100, a, a second makes it a very slow database, right? So um, there are certain you know high volume applications where you might want to minimize the part that's on a smart contract or maybe not use a smart contract at all. Uh, we talked about transparency as a benefit. That can also be a huge drawback. Um, privacy is hard on these blockchains. Now, um, people have done some really neat things with privacy and even some kind of unique um, things. But uh, if you want a lot of privacy for your application, you've got to think hard about that and, and plan for that. And just like we talked about um, permanent data storage being a benefit, it's also a pain as a developer. You know that mistake is always on the blockchain you made. You always have to deal with that piece of data potentially. Um, so you've got to think about, okay, great. If something goes wrong, how do I put a new transaction in that's going to undo that um, that past mistake? And okay, that mistake's always going to be there. I mean, maybe that's good in some ways. You can always see, okay, great, five mistakes on your uh, application. That's pretty good compared to 100 mistakes on Gabe's application. Um, but that's one of the properties. Okay, so great, we've got some drawbacks, some benefits. Um, you know, why uh, would people are people really drawn to this technology? Uh, it's good for distributed systems, um, distributed technological systems, and just distributed groups of humans. So, um, lots of different parties that need to interact with each other uh, might have different levels of trust, and um, who might might come and go, might have their own other systems, but they want to work together. So logistics is a good example of this. We've got all kinds of organizations all over the world, all with their own software system. They need to interact in different ways. And uh, combined logistics systems, right? Blockchains are uh, increasing in usage because it works well for this problem. So you've got cargo ships with, with manifests of what they have on them. And um, by writing those to a, uh, a, set, a, a I guess, a um, blockchain, um, that allows that information to kind of percolate through the rest of the system, even as some of these players come and go. So, uh, you know, customs in one country might uh, read that shipping manifest and then write, okay, great, we've approved this, we've checked that, you know, that's actually on the ship, might write that to a blockchain too. Uh, so even as different customs organizations uh, interact and, and come and go from, uh, from the system, we still have, uh, you know, the record of, of things that have happened um, and everyone can kind of read what's gone on. So an insurer might read that same blockchain and say, okay, great, Customs has approved that that's actually what's on the ship, we're going to insure it. Now it's easy for other parties to check, okay, was that insured? Great, uh, without having to necessarily contact that, um, that insurer and interface with that insurer software. And of course, all that's useful for you know, customer tracking the progress. So as you get some of these really complicated um, systems, a complex system like smart contracts often makes more sense. 
So another great thing about uh, smart contracts is it gives you programmable money, essentially. Um, and that's, that's really interesting. You know, if I give someone a dollar bill, you know, we talk, talk about um, the exchange that's happening there, but it's really interesting to be able to encode in that dollar bill what's going to happen. So you can exchange value when making an API call. So some examples of that is you could say that um, it's money that vests, for instance, that unlocks. Um, so you could replace stock options with that. Stock options unlock um, you know, uh, every month people work at a place normally. So uh, you can do that with money. So like, great, that money is locked up, it's yours, we can access it, it's unlocking um, every month. And then that has some great uh, benefits because uh, then it's fungible. So we talked about previously, now you're like, cool, my money unlocks just like a stock option, except I can go ahead and sell it right away or do whatever I want with it um, because it's, it's money instead of the weird thing that a stock option is. Um, or you could you know, automatically pay on other conditions. So if you can check that something is true, you know, read the New York Times uh, homepage to see if something's true or, or uh, you know, a registry from the county or whatever it is, then you can make money be tied to that and automatically have money you know, pay out when certain things are true. That could be a, you know, a bonus on a sales contract or a referral. Um, you can put things into escrow easily. Like, great, I put my money into this smart contract. As soon as this thing is true, it gets unlocked and paid out um, to this other person. Um, some people have been working on uh, smart legal contracts. So you know, contracts are all around us. Businesses are constantly making contracts with each other, with individuals. Some of those are being encoded in the smart contracts. Great, as things happen in that legal contract, that can trigger payments from other contracts. Uh, we were talking about voting. Great, some proposal passes. We can you know, be like, great, every time someone gives a talk, uh, we're automatically gonna pay one Gabe coin to them. So uh, if we were choosing with a voting contract, who was gonna give the next talk? Great, we elect that person and maybe we check that uh, you know, that talk shows up on the meetup and then great, pay one Gabe coin automatically. So uh, having those things, uh, allows for another interesting uh, thing, which is fractional ownership. So we've got micropayments are really easy now. You know, you can you can pay every time someone reads a, an article or a newspaper or a paragraph or whatever you want. You can chop things up really easily uh, with these micropayments. So that makes fractional ownership really interesting. And some things that people are you know renting or selling fractions of um, include uh, like uh, graphical processing units on computers. You're like great, you want to render some cool uh, 3D scene. You can easily rent some time on a bunch of people's computers, pay them in, in a cryptocurrency for each of those function invocations to render things. Um, so there's some cool platforms like that. Render token is one uh, where you can do that. Um, AI on GPUs. You want to uh, get some nice AI generated images. Uh, you can go to xno.ai and uh, either rent time on other people's machines to do that or rent your own machine out to generate images and run uh, different AI algorithms. Uh, Wi-Fi, talked about that a little bit. There's several different Wi-Fi providers. You're like, great, I can share my Wi-Fi and get paid as people use it. And I can pay people, you know, fractions of a penny every time I use their Wi-Fi all over the world. Um, that's a really cool one. Uh, file storage, another good one. Uh, you know, like, great, I want to have my encrypted files distributed around the other people's storage if available. Maybe I want to rent out my pile of hard drives that I have. Um, that's an easy one, the interplanetary file system. Um, that's a nice building block for smart contracts also. It's got a smart contract, you can just store some stuff, you can easily store it on um, IPFS. Uh, people are doing interesting things with data sharing, um, medical records, other kinds of data um, that you might wanna share with different parties, maybe in the case of medical records, allow access to those from researchers, uh, maybe in an anonymous way. People have been building a lot of really interesting data sharing platforms, um, so another uh, promising area. Um, advertising is a cool one that you can, um, you know, jumps into right away. Uh, you look at lots of ads searching the internet all the time, right? And, uh, you know, the uh, publisher gets paid for running some of those advertisements, the advertising network gets paid for it. Um, but it's your attention that's really being sold there. So the, uh, the basic attention token, which is from, uh, or spun out of Mozilla, uh, allows that to be divided up. So it's like, great. You look at things, you're going to get paid to be advertised to a bit. Publishers are going to be paid. Advertising networks are going to be paid. So it's been chop, chopped up into like fractions of how that system works. And um, because we've got these smart contracts, we can you know divide that up in different ways. 
find ways, new ways of doing that. Now, I know you've all been waiting for this one, ownership of sailboat racing teams, right? Yeah. So um, this is uh, a decentralized autonomous organization, so a, a voting smart contract um, that has ownership of the sailboat racing team. People are doing more things like that, saying like, great, maybe the fans should own this sports team or whatever. Um, so another interesting use of fractional ownership. Okay, a um, couple more cases. Um, you know, smart contracts are useful for a lot of problems, not every problem. And, you know, even most problems, you might look and say, okay, great, smart contract seems like it might be useful here. Do I want a database and centralized system or do I want a decentralized smart contract system? Um, but these are a couple other places where people are using them a lot. Um, title insurance. So um, buy a house, you know, you'll pretty much always pay for title insurance for them to check to see that, that it's been sold to people who all legally had the right to do that. Um, it's pretty much the same every time. You're just like paying money for someone to check a spreadsheet and be like, yep. Um, so having a registry that's transparent and readable, uh, you know, people are, are doing this in various places and I think that's really gonna drive down the cost of that title insurance tax that you pay when you're um, buying a house. Um, similar with uh, land registries in a lot of countries, a lot of countries where ownership of land is being clarified, they're uh, finding that great, a central uh, blockchain for this country uh, where we can record ownership of land um, is a really useful way to do it. Uh, digital assets, we talked a little bit about um, NFT art, um, but a lot of video game assets are starting to be recorded on blockchain. So you find some cool uh, rare sword in a video game, great, your ownership of that might be recorded on a blockchain. And so if you wanna sell that to someone else, that's possible, cool, or buy my rare sword. Uh, if you wanna rent it out to someone who wants to go adventure with it, great, that's possible. People often like, kind of like rent these digital assets, um, all of which is enabled because the record of who owns it is in a registry. Um, and so people can come up with new cool uh, business plans around it. Um, and you know, those can have royalties as we talked about. You can have mechanisms that are kind of advanced around these digital assets. Uh, that um, advertising, the basic attention token is an example of a multi-party market. You've got um, people who are being advertised to, you have publishers, you have ad networks, and those kinds of things are hard to put together. But when you have a system like this where you can say like, okay, great, there's all these fractional incentives that accrue to people, it makes it a little bit easier to build out um, things where a lot of people need to come to the table. Uh, we talked about voting. So the, uh, the main uh, thing that people build for voting is called a decentralized autonomous organization. So it's a smart contract where you say, great, these, these are the rules of it. Um, you can join under some conditions. Maybe you buy some tokens. Maybe you just say, hey, I want to participate, whatever the rules of your smart contract are. Um, that organization then can vote on proposals and start governing things like sailboat racing teams. Uh, a lot of this um, got its start um, when people were trying to get rid of spam. So uh, there was a system called Hashcash years ago. People are like, man, I get all this email spam. I wish that spammers had to like run some computation or something, like somehow pay in order to send me email. And uh, ideas like that um, are still under development where you might have you know, digital toll lanes and different things. You're like, great, uh, sure, you can send email to my email account, might go to my spam, whatever. But if you want to really get my attention, send it through this smart contract, which uh, you've got to pay you know, a dollar to send me an email. Great, but it's going to go to the top of my list. So people build systems like that. Uh, you know, maybe you could do it with job postings, getting emails from recruiters, like, cool, you can send to my recruiter inbox, but it, you know, it costs a dollar each time. And like, oh, great, now maybe I'm looking for a job. I'm going to switch the mode that my recruiter inbox is in, send me job postings, you still have to pay 50 cents, but I'll pay a recruiter 10 bucks for the best one each day. So you can build interesting systems like that. And uh, people are building some really big systems. So uh, things like social networks, I can say like, okay, let's change these incentives a little bit. Similar to that advertising case, we might say, let's build a social network a little bit more owned by the people who are members of that network. So are smart contracts better than other options? Uh, you know, they have their particular use cases that they're really good at. Um, and in, in other cases, they're the wrong choice. And you're just, you know, just need a high through to put database and you can build a centralized site that does that um, really well. Great, that is often the right solution. Um, but if you're building into, you know, one of these types of use cases that we talked about where you want, uh, you know, different parties, you want more decentralization, you want some of these uh, attributes of like programmable money, or fractional ownership, 
then a smart contract is a good choice for those sort of things. And we're a technology group, so we investigate uh, new technologies. So uh, let's let's find out a bit. Let's, let's uh, dive into some of these applications and and see what we have. And we'll do that more in the next talk.